testing. Testing, testing, testing. Okay, you got audio now? How about now? Audio, audio. Yeah, All right. <laughs> uh, okay. Cool. All right. That's good. This is close enough. I don't need to be right up to it, right? Excellent. Yeah, well, I guess it's I guess it's for the webcam. All right. Well, um I guess this is it. So, uh thanks for coming. Um really briefly what the idea of this talk is is just to go over the basics of electronic discovery. Um to talk a little bit about uh, what we as a vendor do for electronic discovery. My name is Jim Holland. I'm from LexisNexis Applied Discovery. We're the electronic discovery division of LexisNexis. We were acquired about a year ago to date, actually. Um, and the reason we were acquired is that LexisNexis saw a growing opportunity in electronic discovery and saw that it was an industry space that was about to explode because it simply made sense for attorneys as a way to practice the discovery phase of major litigation or second request or any other, any other reason why they would find themselves having a need to to undertake a discovery project. So um, today's presentation, we're essentially going to go over five things. We're going to go over why e-discovery matters. Uh, we're going to go over some facts about electronic documents and what e-discovery is and what it means when someone says e-discovery to you. Um, we're going to tell you how to get started on an electronic discovery project or how we would tell a law firm to get started on an electronic discovery project. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what we, Applied Discovery, do as a vendor and finally, I'm going to point you to some resources if you want to learn more on the topic. So the first section, as I said, is why e-discovery matters to you. Um, now, this is the part where I would typically ask some questions of the audience, but since there's only three of us, we'll just go ahead and just sort of start off through this. Um, one of the things um, that's pretty obvious to anyone is the vast majority of business documents, and for that matter, any documents nowadays are created electronically. Um, this figure says 92% of new information is stored electronically. I actually think that figure is pretty conservative. Um, that figure comes from Berkeley, and uh, it's a couple of years old, and I'm going to guess that that number's actually gone up considerably by now. Um, even a couple of years ago, I'm guessing 92% was a conservative number. Um, by the end of 2006, it's estimated that about 60 billion email messages will be sent on a daily basis. That's 10 emails for every person on the planet. You could probably guess that the United States is uh, doing more than their fair share of that 10 per person on the planet. So I would say that easily probably you're talking about 20, 30 emails a day for each person in this country. Um, again, probably a conservative number. So the volume of data out there that is discoverable in a major litigation when a corporation has to present its documents or figure out which documents to turn over to a requesting party is enormous, as you can imagine. Um, less than a third of documents are ever printed. And if you think about that, that makes sense. If you think about your email inbox, you rarely print off most of the emails that are in there. They're typically correspondence. But even though you don't typically print them, they are still discoverable in a litigation or a second request or any time where you're entering a discovery phase. And finally, 60% of business critical information is stored within corporate email systems, up from 33% in 1999. This statistic as well comes from 2002. It's from IDC, which is an IT uh, industry analyst firm. And 
Uh, in 2002, it was 60%, up from 33% in 99. It's 2004 now. We can probably guess that it's jumped a few percentages again since then. So as you can see, there's an enormous amount of data that is stored electronically, and uh, the vast, vast majority of discoverable data, again, in a litigation or second request is going to be in electronic form. What does that mean? That means that the quickest way and the easiest way to do discovery work on data or on a corporation is to do it electronically when you've already got things right for discovery or ready to go. Um, this is an indication of just how much of an advantage there is there. Um, as you can see here, with an electronic discovery solution like Apply Discovery, you can take your native files, you can process them into what we call an online review tool, and you can be ready to review within three days. If you're using the more traditional method, which is to say a scanning and coding, for example, what you need to do is you need to take your native files, you're required to print them, you're required to scan them, then code them, which is obviously going to take a great deal of time, then finally you can load them up and start your discovery phase. In an electronic discovery project, you can literally skip steps two through five here and move straight into the discovery phase. As you can imagine, the printing, the scanning, and the coding are all quite expensive given the amount of data we just told you will be in any major discovery request. So, let's talk about what electronic discovery is and what electronic documents are. What is an e-document? An electronic document is any document that is created on a computer. It's not necessarily a document that is only on a computer. Just because you print it doesn't mean it's no longer an electronic document. If it's created on a computer, it probably still resides on a computer somewhere, and it is still considered an electronic document. The examples are, of course, email, Excel spreadsheets, CAD drawings, and word processing documents. What does it mean to be an e-document? This is actually an extremely important slide. This talks about some of the really compelling advantages over electronic versus paper discovery. There are essentially three layers to a document. There's the front, which is the face of the document, which is very simply what it looks like. You can see the front of this document from where you sit now. You don't need to actually know exactly what it says. It's just the look of the document. There's the middle layer, which is the actual text. This is an area where there's a very compelling advantage in electronic discovery. When you take a file from a computer and move it into an electronic discovery database without ever putting it to paper, everything in that file is searchable. For example, you move over 5 million emails, you search for the word asbestos throughout that 5 million emails, you're going to find every document that contains the word asbestos. If you're doing a scanning and coding solution, you'll find every document that's been coded to have the word asbestos. That's not going to be 100% accurate, as is obvious. Um, electronic discovery is 100% full text indexing, which gives you a compelling advantage. Perhaps the largest advantage of doing it when I'm writing that, like this. That's right, <laughs> exactly. Um, and as long as it's not concept searching, which a lot of electronic discovery solutions will allow you to do, and you can do Boolean searches, which allow you to still get very close. Um, Back of a document is the metadata, and this is where there's an even more compelling advantage to electronic discovery. This is who's read the document, when was the document created, when was the document last modified, who was BCC'd on that, that email, um, did they open it, did they respond to it, did they acknowledge receipt of it. All of that information is saved in metadata. There are over 90 fields of metadata, for example, in an Outlook email. Um, all of that is deemed discoverable by the courts and does show up in an electronic document. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means as we get into the presentation here. So what is true electronic discovery? True electronic discovery entails the gathering, processing, and reviewing of data in an electronic format without ever, ever reducing the data to paper. That's very important. Once the data moves to paper, you lose that metadata. You lose the 100% text indexing. All of that is gone. You can't take a piece, a piece of electronic data, print it, and then scan it back in and have it still be a true electronic document. Um, and basically, you know, this, the, the remaining bullet points here are just essentially furthering that point. Another nice thing is that email conversations and parent-child relationships are maintained in a true electronic discovery database, meaning that you can, when you review an email, you can also review attachments that may have been linked into that email and see exactly the context of the conversation. Um, finally, electronic discovery, we believe that applied discovery should take place in a web-based repository with access from any computer with an internet connection. The reasons for this is obvious. Um, 
it frees you up from geographic limitations and it frees you up from uh, equipment limitations. Essentially, if you have a web browser with a free Acrobat reader on it, you're able to review documents from wherever you are. So if you have a firm in San Francisco and a firm in New York that are needing to share documents, you don't need to be flying the documents back and forth or flying your attorneys back and forth. You're simply able to both review from your desktop. So now let's talk a little bit about what eDiscovery is not. eDiscovery is not the manual review of printed paper from computers. One of the things that's happened with the sort of explosion of email is when somebody is required to do manual review now, it's actually considerably more difficult for them because whereas in the old days a lot of conversations may have taken place across a desk in an office or they may have taken place on the phone or in a conference room, a lot of those conversations now take place in email which means when there's a document production, there's an extreme number of documents, much greater than we used to see uh, previously. Um, you know, everything from what are our dinner plans this Friday to um, actual stuff that is discoverable and relevant to a case. But if you print it, you don't have a way to extract one from the other except for manually viewing each of those pages. So as you can tell, it would take considerably more time. Another thing, of course, when you print paper, print to paper is you lose metadata. You don't have an ability to search on paper. It's all very manual. Um, photocopying is extremely expensive, and courts may not even allow paper production. You may eventually have to go back to electronic production anyway. Um, review of scanned and coded images is also not electronic discovery. Metadata is recreated in coded fields. We just discussed how that's obviously oftentimes very inaccurate. Um, you cannot cap capture full text, just a picture. A lot of times with scanned and coded documents, you don't actually get that front face of the document that we talked about. You just get a representation of the document. It looks a little bit different likely than, than the original document did. And the text in the document is very rarely live. The text is typically, again, coded in unless there's been an OCR solution applied, which are often very inaccurate and provide for incomplete searches. Um, seat licenses and maintenance software upgrades. Um, again, we talked about we would like for electronic discovery to be in a web-based repository so that you don't need to worry about which computer you're at. You don't need to worry about having a seat license. Um, the charge shouldn't be in the tools that you're using. It should be in, you know, there's, there's other ways basically to, uh, to license out the discovery project. Um, software that is used in scanning and coding cases is often is based for managing documents for trial. It's not typically for managing a discovery project, and we found that a lot of people use them for discovery anyway. Um, and again, we talked about the geographic limitations of scanning and coding. Um, and lastly, electronic discovery is not a review of native files. The primary reason for this is we talked about metadata. When you review a Word document in Word, the minute you open the Word document, you're manipulating the metadata for that document. The last time it was revised or the last time it was open is this time. It's the time that you've opened it on your computer. Um, with a true electronic discovery solution, you should be able to see when the document was last opened by the custodian or by uh, the folks that you're doing the discovery work on, not necessarily by you. Um, multiple software programs are required to view. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, applied Discovery, for example, is capable of taking up to 200 different application types and moving all the documents from those different applications over into one format that, again, someone can review from one desktop. Can you imagine trying to review 200 different application types using the native software that, uh, that created them? Obviously impossible. Um, you, would, you would have to have multiple computers to do it. You'd be limited to those computers that that software resided on. Um, it would be quite difficult. Um, you would have an inability to search across all documents. You would only be able to search documents that were from the native application uh, that you were actually doing the review in. Um, there's no means for tagging or annotating, and we'll talk about how applied discovery and ele true electronic discovery solutions make, make a means for that. Um, and you would, of course, have to have an IT staff to manage all of those applications and all the tools that you would need to have that kind of review. Lastly, again, geographic limitations, sort of a theme that recurs here, because one of the real advantages of true electronic discovery is you can do it anywhere, anytime, as long as you have a web browser. So how do you get started on an electronic discovery project? It's actually very similar to how you would get started on any traditional discovery project. It's not that different. You want to identify the who, what, when, and where. First of all, the who question. Who are your custodians? Where are they? Where do you need to gather the documents? So you find yourself with um, you know, a second request or major litigation pending, 
you need to basically figure out where you need to go to gather your data from your custodians. Um, an electronic discovery vendor can help you to do that. They can help you to observe you know, who it is that you need to talk to and work closely with them to basically provide an outline for how to gather that data from the right players. Um, what do you need to gather? So you need to know basically who created the responsive documents, um, what you need to gather from the right custodians. For example, um, with somebody like a CEO, you're likely going to have to gather um, emails, uh, PowerPoints, project files. With someone like an engineer, you're likely going to find yourself gathering CAD drawings. Uh, and with somebody like a marketing department, for example, you might be looking at, or a finance department, you might be looking at spreadsheets or Excel files. Um, so sort of knowing what kind of information you need to get from whom is extremely important. Where do you need to get the data? This is also important. Um, in fact, this is one of the, the more important areas, which is to say, where do companies store their electronic data? Um, a lot of times it's on backup tapes. A lot of times it's on different custodians' computers. Um, and as a requesting party, you have to be very careful to narrow the scope of your request to the specific data that you need for that request. Um, the courts will very much frown upon you saying to somebody like the Ford Motor Company, please provide me with all of your electronic data. They're not going to enforce that. They're basically going to say you're going to have to narrow the scope of your request and you're going to have to base that on the matter at hand. Um, likewise, as a responding party, there's a, there's a great onus on you to have your electronic house in order, if you will, and basically be able to turn over the appropriate data when that request comes through. When someone says, I need the backup tapes from your CEO for the last six months, you need to know where that is. So one of the things that we do at Applied Discovery is we'll really advise people on how to best keep their clients in electronic house in order, if you will, meaning that should a request come through, they're able to fulfill that request relatively easily and quickly um, without a great deal of cost to them. And next is the wind question. Yes? Sure. Hardware doesn't exist anymore, and you guys can deal with that. Huh? Well, we can try. Um, yeah, I, I can't promise you you can always deal with it. Um, we, we've had people literally in our company out on eBay looking for software from the 1980s because we've had data that we've needed to move over from that software into our system. And sometimes we succeed. Sometimes we'll need to subcontract out a forensics firm to help us with that if, if, if need be, if that's required. Um, typically, something that dates back that far, that the software is so far obsolete, um, won't come up in a discovery request anyway because it's, it's, it's just post-dated enough that, you know, typically we just won't see requests that go back that far. Um, but we have had that happen, and we, we will do it as best we can. Um, you know, oftentimes it, it may require coming onto your site and finding the proprietary software that you were originally using to do that. Or, you know. Yeah, so it'd be a challenge. It'd be a challenge, but we'd, we could certainly give it a whirl. Um, we do have some folks on staff who were tasked with just that, is trying to recover the data as best they can in those, in those difficult situations. Um, so which brings me to the next point, which is the when. When is the responsive data from? Um, narrow the scope of that. Again, it's all about keeping your electronic house in order, if you will. Know what documents are where, from what period. That way, when the request comes through, you're very easily able to then essentially retrieve those. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did I get behind myself up here? I sure did. So um, what do we do? What does Applied Discovery do as a vendor? Um, we will essentially help you with data gathering, media restoration, data processing, online review, and document production and reporting. You'll notice that this very closely sort of parallels the things that I was talking about previously. Um, that's because Applied Discovery basically took the traditional process of discovery and moved it over into an electronic world. There's nothing really new to an attorney in electronic discovery. It's just basically the tools. Data gathering. Um, we provide as a service guidance for internal IT resources on site and professional assistance to collect data from clients' computers. Beyond that, we will also work with law firms to help them work with their clients prior to litigation coming up, prior to a second request coming up, to have their system set up so that this is very, very easy. We would always say, 
to a law firm, make sure your corporate counsel is talking to your IT department. Make sure your corporate counsel is helping your IT department to understand how things need to be structured so that if something comes up, you're able to very, very quickly react to it. Um, and that talks a little bit about the cost-effective strategies for gathering and, prepare only, and preparing only necessary data. The more prepared you are in advance, the more cost-effectively you can respond after the fact. However, we can also assist you after the fact to respond as cost-effectively as possible by, again, working through those who, what, when, and where questions that we talked about earlier. Um, we also help people with media restoration. Now, this is often mistakenly called forensics. Forensics is not going into someone's office, finding their backup tapes, and pulling the data off of it. Forensics is finding a hard drive on I-5 that's been run over by a Mac 18-wheeler six times and restoring the data from that. Um, it's considerably more expensive. It's considerably harder to do. And what I'm talking about when I talk about recovering data is not forensics. Um, even what we just talked about a second ago, that's only borderline forensics. Forensics is the recovery of data that's essentially deemed unrecoverable by any IT person. Um, so people shouldn't be paying forensics prices for re restoring their backup tapes. Um, and we'll advise them on that. We can do that for them. Uh, retrieval of information from backup tapes, legacy systems, email, and other file types. So we will come into a corporation, and we'll help them to gather all of the appropriate data. We'll help them to work through those questions, and we'll move that data, uh, and we'll help them to narrow the data, again, based on the scope of the request, or to narrow the data um, in order to respond to a request. Um, data processing. We'll basically process all the data into a standard PDF format. Is everyone in here familiar with PDF and what I mean when I say PDF? So in Adobe format, it completely retains the integrity of the page. A PDF document looks exactly like the document looked prior in its native application. The advantage to PDF is it can be read by a web browser from, again, any remote location. The other advantage to PDF is that it's an industry standard, and everyone's familiar with it, and people know what you mean when you say PDF. Um, a lot of courts are actually asking that productions be done in PDF format, so it's a, it's a very valid format in the legal world. Um, Applied Discovery is able to do about 5 million pages a day into PDF format, so when we come in and we take on a large project, we're able to move over 5 million pages of a, of a company's data into the PDF format in one day. Um, Think about that for a moment if you're talking about printing and or scanning and coding. Think about how long it would take to print, scan, and then code five million pages of data. There's a very, very compelling uh, argument for electronic discovery just in that number alone. Um, and there is the flexibility to process more than 200 electronic file types. We talked about that earlier. We basically narrow the need to have 200 applications down to the need to simply have a web browser. CAD drawings, Excel spreadsheets, all into PDF, all into PDF um, and basically putting into a reviewable format with metadata and parent-child relationships, everything the attached. Aren't you, the you, you don't, and I'll actually, there's some screenshots up here that will give you an example of how the metadata is displayed in the review tool, but PDF does allow you to maintain metadata, and we've written some proprietary code that allows us to keep it attached. But, um, that moves us into the online review section. Once we have it in PDF, we put it into a repository you're able to access from the web, at which point you can, again, see all the different file types in one uniform format. Um, we have very sophisticated search annotation and redaction capability. Um, so essentially, again, um, the example that we used earlier, you type in the word asbestos, it can go out and search across all of those documents that are in that repository and return all of them that have the word asbestos in the document. These are not documents that are coded for asbestos. This is any document that, were, that was typed on the computer from the original creation of the document. Um, there's no hardware or software at all to purchase. Again, you're just basically using a web browser with a free Acrobat plugin on it. Um, and there's multi-party, multi multi-site collaboration with access to, again, one repository. We talked about that quite a bit today already. I want to back up for a second because I forgot to talk about annotation and redaction capability. We also allow you to do redaction and annotations within the, the tool, so you're able to redact the document as well as uh, mark why it's been redacted, attorney-client privilege, um, whatever your reasoning is for redacting it, you're able to do that in the tool, and that will come through in the production. So Correct. It's the Acrobat, it's the Acrobat plug-in to the browser, which gives you a full search across the documents. And then we also have, of course, our own search tool that we've developed. Correct, correct, and you'll see you'll see some examples of that momentarily. 
Um, and then let's talk about production. You are able to pr produce according to your specifications. You're able to essentially produce all the PDF files to a disk that you would then turn over to opposing counsel, the requesting party, or the SEC, or whomever. Um, you're able to do it via an FTP site. Um, of course, you're able to take PDF or TIFF images if you want to then move them into a case management software once you've finished basically figuring out which documents are responsive in the discovery phase. Or, of course, if your opposing counsel or whomever you're producing for wants printed copies, you're able to do that as well. We're able to Bates number and all of that, obviously, as well, prior to production. Um, we're able to create priv logs or user-defined custom reports if you require them. So, all that being said, we can take a look briefly at the interface. Um, I'm not going to show you the whole application, but I'll show you some of the sort of the key screens, and it'll give you an idea of, of how this looks. Um, what you see here is a uh, screen that basically is a summary screen. Down the left side, here you see a list of custodians. You know what? I'm going to turn the lights down. Uh, actually, I don't know how to get to that screen, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, you'll see down the left side here a list of custodians. Um, you know what? It's a little hard to see, so let me see if I can. I think I got it. Wow, it's a little dark. Okay. Yeah. Oop. So, uh, list of custodians down the uh, down the left side there, and then you can basically see how many documents came from that custodian. It says production source total at the top. How many of those documents haven't been reviewed? Uh, how many of them have been? How many of them are hot? And hot basically means you know hey, everybody else, you should have a look at this particular document, whatever you want it to mean within your firm. Um, how many of them are privileged? Um, and how many are responsive? And um, the way that you find documents is here's your search screen. Um, can, we, can we actually kill this for just a second again, possibly? Thanks. Um, So on your search screen here, you basically have, uh, you, know, you can search based on words in the document. You can search based on production source or document ID or date created. You can search on multiple filters, and it will just return documents that meet that criteria. Um, and again, this is searching across all of the documents in the case, so it can literally be you know, well into the millions. And when you're reviewing a document, this is essentially what it looks like. You've got the document here. Um, you're able to then, over here, mark the document for custom collections, which are the collections in gray here are all custom. You're able to then mark, um, you know, by simply checking the box there, you can put the document into any collection that you wish to. Um, the collections at the top there that you see in sort of the greenish color are all uh, essentially um, standard collections that everybody will have whenever they're reviewing in our online review application. And of course, you're able to navigate from document to document. Now, here's an example of some metadata that is attached to a document. You can see over to the right side here, um, you can basically annotate by clicking on that annotations tab. But what we actually have showing is the metadata tab. And you can see the date the document was created, the date that it was last modified, sent, received, delivered, and all the various metadata fields that uh, are typically attached to an Outlook document. Um, again, you'd be able to see who was BCC'd, who opened it, and different metadata fields that were populated in the actual document would show up over here on the right. Correct, both. Uh, correct. Well, we're not actually attaching the full text. The, what a P, when you move over to PDF, you'll actually maintain the full text. It actually just comes with the document. So it's not a background layer. Um, and the metadata as well is fully text indexed. So all the metadata is also searchable. So if you wanted to, for example, find all emails that uh, Dick Cheney had read, you would be able to do that relatively easily. Um, that's because in this particular document, that metadata field isn't populated, um, meaning that there probably wasn't that metadata with this field. But uh, You know, that's a good question. The, the literal two must not be a metadata field. That might just be a, an actual field field, because you can see that it's in the document itself. It's BCC that would be a metadata field, something that wouldn't actually display in the document if that makes sense. Um, and you can see so here. It's, it's searchable because it's... It's searchable. The, 
Yes. Yeah. Um, but there would be, if there was a metadata field, like a BCC field that wasn't in the document itself, that would also be searchable. Um, and then you can see here, uh, there's an attachment that was attached to this email. You can see the, the representation of it up there. If I were to click on this in the online review tool, it would actually launch that spreadsheet, and I would be able to see the contents of the spreadsheet that was attached. And uh, that's just a, a quick tour of the review application. Now I want to point out some additional resources in the event you want to do some more reading on the topic um, that Applied Discovery provides. Um, something that I would actually recommend to anyone that had any interest in electronic discovery is that they, they view our law library. Um, the ABA section of litigation just uh, named us one of the best websites for cases and commentary on electronic discovery. Um, we really take a great deal of time to create this law library. Um, it has everything from white papers on various areas of the law regarding electronic discovery to uh, case law updates. So anytime there's a relevant case to an electronic discovery, uh, to the electronic discovery body of law, we'll basically put a summary of that case and what it means to the body of law up there. Um, there's been a lot of decisions, for example, about cost sharing lately that have come out that have really affected the way that law firms and clients are conducting their business when it comes to electronic discovery. Um, in addition to that, we have a quarterly newsletter that we publish called the eDiscovery Standard, as well as monthly case summary updates that we send out in the form of an email that you can subscribe to, both for free. Um, white papers, this particular white paper is right over here on the table. We've probably produced about five or ten of these that give a really extensive um, view of, again, a particular area of electronic discovery or an overview of the whole body of law. Um, eDiscovery best practices actually uh, it goes into a little more detail about a lot of things I've talked about here today. Um, here's our quarterly newsletter. I believe I also brought some of those that are over there on the table. Um, free newsletter, you can subscribe to it in paper copy or email, whichever you'd prefer. Um, case summary alerts, this is an example of an email uh, that we sent out just, I believe, last month is this one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is, a, this is a case summary alert special bulletin. This is when the Zubalake case came out, which is a, came out of the Southern District of New York, and it was a very important case um, from Judge Sinlin that talked about uh, how cost sharing uh, should be addressed in electronic discovery cases. Uh, when was a requesting party's uh, scope of request unreasonable? When was a responding party uh, still going to be required to pay for it? That kind of thing. It's actually, it's actually a pretty fascinating read. Um, and that's about it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd be certainly happy to answer them. Well, that's, forensics is one of those words where people use it really differently. Um, technically, if you delete an email, it's, it's hardly forensic for someone to retrieve that email. Um, we've all heard a million times that delete doesn't really mean delete. Um, it's still there. It's still actually on your hard drive. It's relatively easy to get to. Um, it's not going to take someone with an extremely advanced uh, set of tools or knowledge to, to retrieve that email. Um, I would say that forensics is more if you deleted an email you know, six months ago, and that space on your hard drive where that deleted email resides has been overwritten by a couple of files, um, trying to backtrack and maybe retrieve the file out of there. Um, or piece together, you know, bits of the binary code to, to re-piece together the file that's maybe been broken up. That I would look at as more being forensics. Um, Mandating a policy that you delete your email after 180 days is the kind of thing that we would likely, and it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, suggest that law firms might want to advise their clients to do. Um, however, you have to be really careful with foliation issues when you do that because if there's pending litigation and you're deleting files that you know may be responsive uh, to that litigation, obviously you could get into trouble. So it's a little more complicated than just telling people not to save their data. It's really much more having the IT department and the corporate counsel work very closely together 
um, probably on an ongoing basis to continue to define what's okay and what's not okay. Um, and it really, really will ultimately save that client a potential gold mine worth of money if they have things in order so that when a requesting party comes through, um, again, if the request is reasonable within the scope of the litigation, it's on the responding party to pay for that. So the responding party needs to make sure that they're able to respond uh, in a cost-efficient and effective manner. Um, I think that's often going to happen on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's probably going to be dictated by the courts. I should preface all this by saying I'm not an attorney, so please caref you know, be careful. Like, don't place this advice too much to heart. But um, I would think that basically, you know, given the availability of, again, electronic discovery tools like this that are out there, um, you should be able to narrow the scope somewhat to just the responsive documents, although that's certainly not easy. And um, I don't think the requesting party is going to necessarily want you to produce every email that's been sent within, you know, the academic offices at, at whatever university we're, we're speaking of. Um, so it is a complicated issue. Um, but it's a complicated issue that's not new. It's a similar issue to, you know, what's been going on in litigation for all time. I mean, this, this happened in the paper world, too. The challenge is what I addressed earlier, which is to say that there's a lot more correspondence now that is, that is presented in a discovery because of email. Um, previous things that would only be brought out in a deposition, in a verbal deposition, are now being brought out in the form of paper or electronic documents. Um, and I think it's very challenging to figure out how to respond to that, actually. Um, but I think, I think basically consulting with counsel and consulting with an electronic discovery vendor uh, is, a very, is, is something that you would always want to undertake in those cases. That's okay. Um, I don't believe we have, actually. Um, I can't think of any examples where we've worked with the university offhand. Um, keep in mind, my, I actually don't work typically with the clients very much. I'm sort of pre-sale as opposed to post-sale. Um, we tend to work with AMLAW 200 law firms, basically. And some of them may be representing a university in some of the cases. But I actually don't even think we've had a university in one of our cases. Absolutely. Um, I, I think just lack of pro lack of lack of order. Um, f you know, not to sound flippant, but I think it's just I think people just don't. Um, Or just not having a policy on backup tapes and how long backup tapes are stored for, when backup tapes are deleted, um, how backup tapes are created. So basically, um, again, we work with law firms typically, and we really advise them on how to work with their clients. But I really think that basically the IT departments and probably most of your Fortune 500 companies are ignorant of the legal issues that potentially face them. Um, and I would guess, you know, I'd venture to say that probably a very low percentage of IT heads meet with their corporate counsel on a regular basis to figure out ways to uh, ensure that in the event of large-scale litigation, they're able to comply. Um, and the courts have shown to be very, very uh, unapologetic when you're not able to reply to a request appropriately. Um, the onus is on you. Um, and, you know, they will do their part to make sure that the request is reasonable. Um, there have certainly been cases where uh, you know, for example, there was a case that Ford was involved with that we wrote a case summary on that's actually in the law library that I just spoke about where, uh, and I can't remember the exact details of, of which side it happened on, but the requesting party finally 
ask the courts for access to the responding party's uh, systems because the responding party was unable to comply with the request, uh, even though the courts had enforced that request as reasonable. Um, they were unable to meet the meet the meet the requirements. So basically, so they exactly, and exactly, um, and it was it was challenged because of proprietary information in there. And the responding party challenged it based on the idea that the requesting party was going into information that actually had nothing to do with the case and was not responsive and was actually proprietary and damaging to, to the responding party. Um, it's a complex area, and it's the hardest part of electronic discovery right now, uh, I think. Um, once, once the data is gathered and the tools are in order, uh, the discovery part is, is basically cake. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Okay. Can I? I just need to uh, delete that PowerPoint on your guys to get to the. Oh, you did? Thank you. You guys both from out of town? Yeah. If it's not typically like this here for enjoying the weather. Yeah, this is this may be the hottest day we get this year. Hey, no, I, well, I grew up in Virginia, but I've lived here for for ten years. Basically, from here, transplanted.
Thanks a lot for your help.